Well, we're transitioning into the service where we are going to take an, a more in-depth look at God's word because we absolutely believe that this is God's word given to us that we might understand who God is and what he is doing and how he calls us to respond. And as we look, we're going to be challenged by what it means to experience what we just sang about, the depth, the power of God's love in our lives. When I was thinking about the passage that Scott read for us this morning, there was a, um, a certain children's story that came to mind, and I'm sure it came to all of your minds just as quickly. Can you tell me what this is from? Okay, I'm not, I'm not getting a strong response here. <laughs> little Red Riding Hood, absolutely. I was a little concerned here that I was the only child who ever grew up with Little Red Riding Hood. Um, okay, so for the two or three of you who have actually uh, read this story, do you remember what's going on in this scene right here? There's a conversation taking place. Do you remember what that conversation is like? Yeah, Grandma, what big eyes you have, what big ears you have, what massive claws you have at the end of your feet, what enormously hairy, furry face you have. Um, this story bothers me. Does this story bother you? Have you ever thought? how weird, how bizarre this story is. I'm not talking about the fact that we have a talking wolf. Um, I, I, can, I can go with that. What bothers me about this story is how long it takes Red to get it. How, how is it possible that she doesn't walk into the room and say to herself or say out loud, oh, look, there's a wolf wearing grandma's clothes. It bothers me. I mean, who thinks this way? Uh, first she sees the eye, then she sees the ear, then she sees the giant snout, then she sees, you know, whatever. Why does it take so long for her to put together, this is a wolf in grandma's clothing? When I thought about it, though, and the reason that story came to mind is because you and I do the exact same thing. But we do it with ourselves. I overreact to someone who's critical of me and I tell myself that I'm just tired. I fail to be generous with someone who's in need and I tell myself I'm just being careful. I'm selfish with my time or resources. And I tell myself, I just need a break. And what I never, ever see, what I never acknowledge, is that all of those things are connected. All of those things like it, the pride, the struggle with sin, the, 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 the anger, the self-centeredness, all of it is a sign that underneath there is a wolf at work in my life that has to be acknowledged, has to be faced up to, and has to be dealt with. And in a very real way, when we come to this passage in Ephesians, this is exactly what Paul is dealing with. There is a wolf at work that we tend to just excuse by seeing only bits and pieces of it, but is a danger of causing serious damage in the lives of the Ephesians, in our lives. And Paul makes this the focus of his prayer. And before we get in depth into this passage, let's review a little bit what we know about the Ephesians, because this is going to be helpful. Remember, Paul is writing to a church that is made up of both Jews and Gentiles. They are in a very important port city in the Roman Empire. And this is a city that is very well known for being a pagan city. In fact, this picture up here is a picture of the goddess Artemis. Artemis was sort of the main goddess that they worshipped in Ephesus. And the temple, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, that they built 
for Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a remarkable achievement of, of archaeology and art. Archaeology, architecture, there we go. And I have two of those in my family. You would think I'd get that right. Um, it was a remarkable achievement of architecture and, and a beautiful artistic accomplishment. And it was all dedicated to her. Now, a couple things to know about what they believed about Artemis. They believed that Artemis was the goddess of the hunt. She was the goddess of wild animals. And she was the goddess of childbirth. So she was a very, very important person. There was a reason that they elevated her. And you see, their belief was that if someone died in childbirth, which happened a lot back then, that that happened because Artemis was mad at them. Before hunters would go out on the hunt, they would go through all kinds of rituals to try to make Artemis, put Artemis on their side and have Artemis help them be successful in their hunt. Now, here's the weirdest one. This is the one that's going to be near and dear to all you Baylor fans. Every year, little girls, very little girls, would be sent to the temple and they would have to stay there for one year. And their job was one thing. They had to act like a bear. Not kidding. Why did they do that? Um, because in their thinking, in their stories about Artemis, Artemis, being the goddess of wild animals, had a favorite bear. And someone very foolishly killed that bear. And so what Artemis demanded, if she was going to keep from, from being angry at them and destroying them, what she demanded is that every year, the little girls of the town, certain age, would go to the temple, live there for a year, and act like a bear. Um, here's the point. The point is not that Baylor goes all the way back to the times of Artemis. The point is that this, the Ephesian culture, Ephesus was a culture that was heavily influenced in their daily practices by the belief that the gods, and especially the god Artemis, was, was fickle. She could change her mind. She could, she could just decide she's angry with someone and kill that person in childbirth. And she was limited. This is someone who could have a favorite in her life, something she loved and cared for, and a limited human being could come along and take it from her. That is the picture that they had of God of what it was like to worship and be in relationship with a God. And when Paul comes to the book of Ephesians, part of what he is doing for this church, for these people, is he is saying, I want you to have a very, very different picture, a different understanding of who God is. And if you remember, as we've gone through Ephesians, that's exactly what Paul does in the first half of the book, in the first three chapters. He focuses on this is what God has done. In chapter 1, he talks about the blessings and unity that come from God. And he ends chapter 1 with the first prayer that we find in Ephesians. And it is a prayer that the Ephesians would know this God who blesses them and who unites them. He would know, they would know him intimately. In chapter 2, he makes the focus on God has made them spiritually alive. They had been spiritually dead. They had been completely separated from God. In fact, they did not know God at all. But God pursued them and he made them alive. And then he shifts his focus. He said, it's not only that you've been made alive and made right with me, with God. God has also brought you together as a people. He has united you. He has taken people who should be enemies. And he has brought them together as family. Another way you could describe what's going on in Ephesians 2, it's a really interesting way to think about this. But it's the question, what is your lead identity? What is your lead identity? Are you first a husband? Are you first a mom? When you walk into a room, do you think of yourself first as a certain ethnicity? 
Um, would you admit it today that you're, you know, you're first an Aggie or first a Longhorn? Are you first a Republican or Democrat? And what Paul is saying in chapter 2 is that your lead identity must be always that you are in Christ. That is who you are. And then chapter 3 opens with Paul having said this. Chapter 3 opens, and Slade showed us this last week, with this statement, for this reason. And then he gets distracted. And you're sitting there thinking, for this reason what? For this reason you think this, for this reason you feel this, for this reason you do this, for this reason what? And what Paul does is he says, for this reason, hang on for a second, let me develop the thought more about the unity that God has given us and the ministry that God has given us to reveal the gospel. And now when we get to the last half of chapter 3, Paul does the second prayer that we find in Ephesians. And what he actually does is he resumes the thought. He picks up the cliffhanger he left us with in 3.1. And he starts over with the same words again, for this reason. And what Paul tells the Ephesians is that this is how he prays for them. And he starts first by describing the God that he prays to. Then he tells them what the request actually is, and it's a request for power from God. And then he ends with this extraordinary declaration of praise because of God's power. But first thing he does in picking up in verse 14 is he establishes that for this reason, going back to verse 1, for this reason... He prays. That's what he's saying when he bows my knees. I come before the Father and I pray. And the heart of his prayer is actually going to be in the next section. But first he wants them to understand something about God. And to understand what he's saying, let's start with the last word named. In that culture, your lead identity how you would be understood, how other people would understand you, how you would understand yourself was defined by who your father was. It was actually defined by the father of the house. So even if you were a wife, your identity was as a wife, I am the wife of this person. That is my lead identity. If you are a child, I am a child of this person. It's not that you are a Roman first. It's not that you are a Greek first. It's not that you are a Jew first. In that society, it was first and foremost, I am identified by the father who names this family. And what that meant was that the father was responsible for caring for that family, for protecting that family. And the family was responsible to revolve their entire lives around him. So here's what that meant. If that father was a worshiper of Artemis, everyone in that family was required to be a worshiper of Artemis. If that father valued wealth above everything else, then that entire family's efforts were going to be about the accumulation of wealth. Everything revolved around the father. And what Paul is saying here is that every family on in heaven, every family on earth is to revolve around God the Father. He applies it to everything in all of creation. Even the angels in heaven understand their role. They understand their identity. They understand their responsibilities by who God is. And he is saying it doesn't matter if you are Jew or Roman or Greek or Native American or what you, every person, every aspect in creation is to revolve around, to be, to get their identity from who God is, the one true God. Think about how different that is from what the people in Ephesus understood about God. You see, the people in Ephesus understood that Artemis could come and go. The reason you build a giant temple for Artemis is so she will stay there 
And so she won't go off and, and take care of another city. So she won't abandon them. They knew that she was limited or believed that she was limited. Right? Someone could come along and kill her favorite bear. They believed that if you worship Artemis, if you did these rituals for her, then you would get what you wanted from her, a successful hunt, successful childbirth. And Paul is saying there are no limits that apply to God. He names, he is the authority over, the caregiver over, and is to be the center of everything, everywhere, in all of creation, in what we can see on earth and in what we cannot see in heaven. God is the one who names. We, um, we don't think of God's limits in the same way that the people in Ephesus thought of God's limits. But we have them. We say to ourselves that God is limited by our circumstances. We say to ourselves that God is limited by our sin. And on Friday morning, I came face to face with one that I had not thought about before. God is limited by my plans and preferences. Here's what I mean by that. I got into my car Friday morning with my ever-present, trusty travel mug of Harry and David coffee. And I sat in the car before I even turned it on. I took a drink. But it was not a successful drink. Because the lid was not on properly. So what I did was I took my second shower of the day in hot coffee. It wasn't that funny, Liam. <laughs> it was everywhere. When I say everywhere, I mean everywhere. And I had to go change all my clothes. And I can promise you with absolute certainty that when I went back into the house to change my clothes, I was not skipping. I was not dancing. I was marching, stamping my feet. I was angry. I was frustrated. Why was I angry? Why was I frustrated? Well, okay, let's be honest. It's no use crying over spilled milk, but spilled coffee is worth crying over. Um, the real issue is I stepped back much later in the day and evaluated what was going on in my heart. It didn't have a whole lot to do with spilled coffee and needing to change clothes. It had to do with the fact that I had a plan for my day. And the first thing that happened in my day was that my, plan, my schedule was completely derailed. And what it did to me internally was to tell me that I was incompetent. I was small. I was incapable of carrying out the simplest of my plans. It wasn't about spilled coffee. It was about the fact that when my plans and my preferences were derailed, things are going to be bad. But the truth is, God is able to work in and through my life, and he is not limited by my plans or what I want to have happen with my day. 
Paul reminds the Ephesians that God is sovereign and he is sovereign over absolutely everything, every moment, every situation. And I can do something as silly and stupid as pouring coffee on myself. And that doesn't mean that God has to wipe his hands and say, well, you're on your own today because plans are not working out. I don't know if you struggle with that. But I have this tendency to think that God works through my plans. And when my plans derail, God stops working. Never say that out loud. But a spilled cup of coffee helped me confront that in myself. Paul reminds him that God is sovereign. He is at work. And then he gives the heart of his request. And the heart of his request, which starts in verse 16, is that God would give power to the Ephesians. Now, here is the core of his prayer. What he prays is that God would grant them to be strengthened in their inner being. The first thing that you have to notice is God is not give, asking them for strength to overcome a particular obstacle. He's not asking them for, he's not praying on their behalf that God would give them physical strength to overcome a certain illness or a certain challenge. What he is asking for is that there would be strength in the inner being, who they are inside, what goes on inside of them as life happens. It would be what was going on inside of me as that cup of coffee just started to become a baptismal fount in my life. Paul says that he wants them to be strengthened through his spirit. What does it mean to be strengthened with power through his spirit? That is a way of saying that the Holy Spirit would make them strong with God's ability to act. This word strengthened is literally the idea of making something firm, making something established, making something strong. And the word that's translated power is an interesting word. It means to have the capacity to do something to have an ability. So what he's talking about is that the Holy Spirit would give them capacity, God's capacity to stand firm and to stand firm at the innermost part of who they are. How does this work? Well, when I spilled coffee all over myself, the first thing that I needed to do was to recognize it my reaction was because there was a lot more at stake than clothes and coffee. My reaction had to do with what I was thinking about myself. My reaction had to do with how I was diminishing myself and assuming that now my day was a loss. What I need to do, what I want to do, is I want my words and my actions to be godly words and actions. I want my response to be a godly response. But the problem is my words and actions come from somewhere. My words and actions flow out of what's going on me inside. And what Paul is praying for the Ephesians is that part on the inside of them. Out of which the words and actions come would be strengthened with the core abilities that, have, that God provides. If I'm feeling small, if I'm feeling weak, that shows up in how I act. If I'm feeling superior, it shows up in how I act and what I say to the people around me. And what Paul is doing is he is saying, what I want for you, Ephesians, is that inner part that drives out of which everything flows, your actions and your words, would be governed by the power of God and reflect his power. There's a result that Paul wants to see from that. When you see the word so that, it's one Greek word, it usually indicates result. The result is that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The word dwell here is an interesting word that means to take residence, to settle in, to sit down in and to stay permanently. Now remember, Paul's writing to Christians. These are people who already have Christ in his life. What is he asking for here? He is asking that Jesus would more and more 
make a home in their hearts. And then at the end of verse 17, he starts to spell out why it is he prays this. Why does he want Jesus to be more and more established in their hearts? And the reason is that they may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints. And what is it that they are to comprehend? This is really, you kind of get a sense of Paul is so excited, it's almost like he's losing control of himself. What is the breadth and length and height and depth of what? He doesn't say. He just stops. It is almost certainly that they would understand the vastness of God's love in Christ. What he prays is that they would have the strength to comprehend the unlimited vastness of God's love expressed in Christ. And I want you to stop and think about what a bizarre statement that is. Why do you need strength to comprehend the love of God? Isn't it something that we want even in our weakest moments? Yes. Why does he pray for strength? Well, I think it has to do with this. When you come to grips with how much God loves you, when you start to comprehend that, there are at least two different things that happen inside of you. The first thing that happens inside of you, when you start to understand how much God loves you, you start to realize there is no way I am worthy of that love. There is no way I deserve for the creator and sustainer of the universe who is altogether perfect, altogether holy, altogether loving. I do not deserve him to love me who is not altogether perfect, who is not holy and just. The more we understand the love of God, the more we are forced to come to grips with the fact that we fall so, so far short of that love. And as we come to understand the love of God, we also more and more come to understand something else. We do not love well. Oh, I might love better than this person over here. But that person's not the standard. God is the standard. When I come to grips with the fact that God is unfailing and sacrificial in his desire for my good and his desire to be in relationship with me, I start to realize how quick I am to cut off other people in my relationships, how quick I am to be selfish in my relationships, and how quick I am to say I won't sacrifice that much for that person. To come to grips with the love of God requires that we face things about ourselves that we do not want to face. And Paul prays that they would have God's strength to be able to comprehend the vastness of God's love. What Paul desires is that the internal mess that's at work in each one of us, the internal mess of doubts and fears and confusion and pride and misplaced confidence and anger and all the other stuff that's inside you and me that we don't want to think about or talk about, but we desperately want replaced. Paul says he prays that they would have the strength to understand the depths, the vastness of God's love, that those things inside of us would start to be replaced. And it would be replaced by the fullness of God's character. That it would be replaced by God's capacity to respond to the world. And that the Holy Spirit would change us from the inside out. I had a conversation with someone just a couple days ago. Um, this person was very, very frustrated by a friend of hers' very bad decisions. Um, this friend couldn't hold down a job, uh, was it constant, just constantly quitting jobs. This friend was burning 
bridges in relationships. It was causing all, she was just causing all kinds of chaos for people around her. And my friend is just talking to me about this and just letting all of this out. And my response was to go, yeah, that's right. That's horrible. I can't believe this person made that decision. You got to be kidding me. She quit another job. That is unreal. And I just went right along with it and, and was thinking I was encouraging that person. And I came home later that day and, and I looked at this passage and I realized how completely off base my response was. What I needed to do for this person was to point her to and pray with her along the same lines that Paul prays. Instead of just wallowing in frustration to help this person, to help my friend, pray that her friend would better understand God's love that her friend would better understand and better have the power of God at work in her life so that she would respond to circumstances the way that God responds to circumstances. Paul reports to the Ephesians that this is how he is praying to them, to the sovereign God of the universe. And then he ends his prayer with an explosion of praise because of the power of God. And that's the last two wonderful, wonderful verses. The bottom line to Paul's praise is that God can do exactly what Paul prays for the Ephesians and more. And when he says far more abundantly, the best English translation that we have was provided by Buzz Lightyear. God can do infinity and beyond what you ask and what you think. Take a second and think about, start compiling a list of all those things within you that you wish would change. All the fears, the doubts, the anger, the confusion, all of that stuff that drives your reactions, all of that stuff, that, the buttons that get pushed, that caused you to, to lash out at people. If you could make an exhaustive list of everything that you could think of over the course of a week, what Paul is saying here is your list wouldn't capture it all. God is able to step into your life and he is able to change everything on that list. But you know what? He is able to change everything that's not on that list but should be. Everything beyond what you could ask or think. What Paul wants above all else in his life and for the life of the Ephesians and for our lives is expressed in verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Paul is praying, Paul is longing for, desiring deeply that the character of God, the attributes of God, who God is, would be evident in the church and in Jesus Christ. And he desires that as the Ephesians are transformed more and more in the inner being, because they more deeply understand God's love and because God's power is at work in them, that God's character would be evident in the church. And with these words, Paul ends the first half of the book of Ephesians. And then he gets going to take us into the second half starting next week with, now how do you live that out in your relationships day in and day out? We end this prayer and we are faced with a very challenging question. Do you pray like Paul? When you read these verses, do you hear your prayers? Take a mental inventory for a second. What have you prayed for for the last 24 hours? For the last week? For the last month? I'm not suggesting that what you prayed for was wrong. 
I'm only asking the question, was Paul's prayer for a deeper understanding of God's love and that God's power would transform who you are in your heart? Was that in your prayers? And now let me ask you a harder question. Paul's not praying that for himself. He's praying that for people he hasn't even met in some cases. How much have you prayed that the people in this room, people in your family, people at work, would come to know the love of God in a deep way and have the power of God at work in them so they would respond to the world just like God would. That is Paul's prayer. Paul reminds the Ephesians that God is sovereign. Paul prays for God's power to strengthen them, to change them and transform them. And then Paul praises God because he can accomplish everything and more that Paul prays for. And that's the point of the passage. Pray for one another to be strengthened by a deeper understanding of God's love by the power of God at work. Do you know that the story of Little Red Riding Hood goes back to the 10th century, to the 900s? Do you know that the original versions of that story do not have a happy ending? Unless you're the wolf. The way the original versions of the story ends is that the wolf eats grandma and red, the end. And that is exactly what we fear. There's a wolf inside of us that's consistently responding badly to everything around us, consistently gives into temptation, consistently acts out of fear and insecurity, pride. And we fear that that wolf will just devour us and we will never have victory over it. But Paul gives us a prayer that gives us hope. He shows us to pray for the strength that comes from a deeper knowledge of God's love. He shows us to pray for the strength that comes when the Holy Spirit gives us God's power to work in us. And Paul's prayer is not just a model for us to pray for ourselves. It is a model to make this a way of praying for one another. So how do we respond to this? Where do we go with this? Well, as always, I encourage you to take this paragraph and, and write it out in your own words, really causing you to come to grips with what is he saying here. Then encourage one another, support one another, strengthen one another by sharing with one another where you feel that you need to be strengthened by God. Pray for someone that you don't usually pray for. Pray this prayer for someone you don't usually pray for. Make it a discipline. Don't just do it one time. Make it a discipline. Spend the next month daily praying for someone that they would have a deeper understanding of the love of God and that God's power would work to transform them so they would respond to the world just as God would respond. And you know what? A month from now, tell them how you've been praying. I think that'd be a huge encouragement. And here's the thing. When we pray things like this, God answers and God is at work in your life. He is at work in your life this week to help you better understand God's love and to better understand his power at work in you to transform you. And the question is, are you paying attention? Are you paying attention to what he is doing? Take time this week to pay attention 
to how God is intervening in your life to answer the very prayers that Paul has prayed. If you are someone who is just starting out on your journey to know who God is, then I would encourage you to take some time and pray that you would know God's love. And if you're someone who's been following Christ for a long time, then your assignment is to look around you and say, whom do I pray for that they would have a deeper understanding of God's love? No matter which one of those categories that you're in, when we close here in a second, we're going to have a group of folks up here whose whole point, whose whole purpose is just to talk to you and listen to you and pray with you. And if you want to know more about what does it mean to walk in God's love, to know God's love, they want to help you. If you want to pray for something that's going on in your life, they want to help you. So would you stand with me as we close in prayer? And as we stand, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. Heavenly Father, we cannot begin to grasp the vastness of your love for us expressed in Christ. How do we understand that the perfect, holy, righteous God sent his son to die on a cross for imperfect, unholy, and unrighteous people? that we might be in relationship with you, that we might find forgiveness. Lord, we just, that is a love that is beyond what we can comprehend. But yet Paul prays that we would at least make a start, that we would comprehend it more, that we would understand it better. And Lord, that is what I ask for us as we leave here today. That we would understand a little bit more the love that is beyond comprehension and the power that is at work within us. And Lord, that we would leave here in awe of who you are because of your love and your power. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So let me leave you with this thought. God's love for you is so vast, you cannot begin to comprehend it. But the challenge for you is to try anyway. To leave here with a desire to know God's love a little bit better this week and to make it known to the people around you. You are dismissed.